are these people? So over the weekend, big weekend in in DC. It was not only Pride weekend, but it was also the uh, the Red Line rally. So mm. it's named because obviously, you know, Biden was like, oh, uh, Israel invading Rafa was his red line and it wasn't. Uh, so, you know, so people were like, well, we will make that red line on Palestine's behalf. So over the weekend, uh, a mass of people, I did not go. Um, mm. for, well, I'll explain why I didn't go later, but I did have reasons, uh, which we'll get into. Um, but there was a wave of people who came into DC uh, over the weekend, uh, some for this mm. uh, rally, which was held right at the White House. Um, so we're going to report on this from the view of one of our favorites, Common Dreams, uh, from Jessica Corbett, who we, I think, have used quite a bit as of yeah. late. Um, <clears throat> where she writes, thousands protest Gaza genocide in Red Line White House rally. We as a people are drawing a red line today to say enough is enough, said a protester from the Palestinian youth movement. It's time for an arms embargo, and it's time to end this. So Jessica continues. As the IDF on Saturday killed over 200 more Palestinians in the Gaza Strip while rescuing four hostages taken on Hamas on October 7th, thousands of anti-war protesters descended on the White House in Washington, D.C. The rally knocked, marked not only eight months of the war, but also called out U.S. President Joe Biden for his seemingly empty threat to cut off American arms and diplomatic support for the Israeli military campaign, you which has killed the, more than 36, 800,000 people and wounded over 83, 600,000 in Hamas governed Gaza since October. Biden threatened to end U.S. support for Israel's war, which he has led to a genocide case before the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court pr prosecutor to seek arrest warrants for press Israeli Prime Minister Ben Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yoav Gallant if the IDF attacked Rafa, calling it a red line. Mm -hmm. However, when Israeli forces began assaulting the southern Gaza city, to which over a million Palestinians have fled and seized the border crossing with Egypt, further limiting the flow of desperately needed humanitarian aid, the White House claimed the actions didn't amount to crossing what critics called the Biden administration ever shifting red lines. Mm -hmm. However, when Israeli forces began assaulting the southern Gaza city, to which over a million... Oh, wait, I read that already. Um, pro... I uh, cut the wrong place. Protesters in... D.C. on Saturday held signs that said, genocide is our red line and Israel bombs your taxes pay, the Washington Post reported. According to the newspaper, Aya, a George Washington student and a leader of GW Justice for J Students for Justice in Palestine, said the student activism has really lit a fire under the free Palestine movement because it has pushed the bounds of what we are here in the United States and the diaspora are willing to sacrifice. Before police shut it down last month, hundreds of G GWU students set up a pro-Palestinian encampment, one of numerous throughout the country. Aya, who didn't want to share a last name for privacy reasons, says students wanted Gazans to know they are not alone. We say at campus protests, we will not rest until you divest, and we mean that. We have been out here. Sorry. Oh. Who knows me? Where'd go? Um, next one for it. Next one. This there one, you know. yep. Um, we say at campus protests, we will not rest till you divest, and we mean that. We have been out here tirelessly, I said. I mean, how can we tie when we see the people of Gaza endure through literally hell on earth? The protest is chanted from D.C. to Palestine, we are the red line, and held a red banner around the White House as a symbol of Biden's claims, with some reference directly when detailing their reasons for joining the demonstration. The intention is to draw a red line where Biden won't draw one when it comes to Israel's genocide in Gaza, 
and say, we as a people are drawing the red line today to say enough is enough. Naz Issa of the Palestinian youth movement told NBC News, it's time for an arms embargo and it's time to end this. Mm -hmm. A Johns France press also spoke with participants critical at the Biden administration for supporting the Israeli war effort as it mediates ceasefire negotiations alongside Egypt and Qatar. I no longer believe any of the words that Joe Biden says, exclaimed Zaid Mawadi, a 25-year-old protester from Virginia whose parents are Palestinian. This red line in his rhetoric is rubbish. It shows his hypocrisy and his cowardice. Multiple protesters, including some who voted for Biden in 2020, told AFP and NBC that they won't cast ballot ballots for the Democrat in November. None of them signal support for former President Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee, but some said they may vote for third party or independent candidates who lack the support needed to beat the two major party contenders. Mm -hmm. Polling and the uncommitted campaigns during state primaries have shown that Biden backing Israel's war is costing him votes. Ben the Ark, Jewish Action, and the NAACP delivered similar warnings this week, with the former CEO writing that U.S. support for continued violence in Gaza is putting American safety and U.S. democracy in danger. In response to the Saturday protest, Biden campaign spokesperson Jeff Schultzer said that the president believes making your voice heard and participating in our democracy is fundamental to, to who we are as Americans. He shares a goal for an end to the violence and a just, lasting peace in the Middle East, Schultz just added, he's working tirelessly to that end. Of course he is. Sure, that's a pack of lies, but go on, yeah. oh, whatever. While Biden, was in France, while Biden was in France on Saturday for a state visit with French President Emmanuel Macron and the D-Day anniversary, a Secret Service spokesperson told The Hill that in anticipation of protests, additional public safety message, including anti-scale fencing, have been put in place near the White House complex. Gee, that sounds familiar. Sounds like something that happened like four years ago around this time. Um, but I digress again. Biden in France that I want to echo President Macron's comments welcoming the safe rescue of four hostages that were returned to their families in Israel. We I'm won't stop working that. until all the hostages come home and the ceasefire is reached. The White House put out a statement along the same lines, which, as the anti-war group Code Pink highlighted, also did not recognize the hundreds of Palestinians killed and injured in the IDF operation at Gaza's Nusrat refugee camp. Speaking at the DC rally, Code Pink East Coast organizer Chris Serrazer said that we stand side by side with struggles across the globe to tell everybody in the White House that we can see them. We can see them for who they for what they are, and that this war and and that is war criminals war criminals who deserve to be held accountable for the countless genocides, the countless wars, and the countless crimes they have committed against black and brown people across the globe. We say no to war, we say no to bombs. We say no to mines, to planes, to tanks. We say no, said Sir declared. We say yes to education, we say yes to food, to care for the community, but we say no to being led by people who only care about funding war. Um, any thoughts before I continue? No, nope. I mean, sounds about right for the most part. Um, you know, I know, I know we have some thoughts to say about just what happened in general, you know, but mm -hmm. I definitely think it's, it's uh, Biden's red line is stupid. And the fact that people are willing to at least try to hold him accountable, I think, could, you know, but wish they would actually listen to you, you know, that would be nice. So, but, you know, I don't, I don't think there's enough inflatable guillotines out there, so we'll see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Um, nice, soft, inflatable guillotine. That's all you need. Um, but, yeah, you, any thoughts before you move, move on? No, but, so let's get into the actual rally. So, uh, for Fisher, um, very known in space, um, editor, journalist. Um, he <laughs> he did extensive coverage on this. 
Yeah. Um, so I would highly suggest you guys go to his YouTube channel. I think his YouTube channel is New Share. Um, he has a ton of footage of, I think he has at least over an hour's worth of footage of actually just parts of the protest. It looks like he was there all day. And, yeah. um, and recorded a lot of coverage. So I highly recommend you go to his YouTube channel if you're interested to uh, see more of the rally. I recommend that you either follow him on Twitter or you go to his YouTube page. I think it is at New Share, and you can check out the rally there. We're not obviously for time. We're not going to watch the whole all of it. We're just going to take some parts of it. Um, but he did tweet out um. Saturday morning or early Saturday afternoon, uh, if you zoom in a little reef, yep. um, where he said, one hour into pro-Palestine demonstration at White House, the police, police deployed mace into surrounding crowd, including myself, while arresting someone, video on the way. So obviously, you know, given what Jessica reported, that they put up the security fence around uh, Lafayette Square. Uh, that's where the White House is in D.C. Um, so obviously they were prepared and had their stormtroopers ready, uh, I would guess. So here is... Come on, slide. So here's where Fisher kind of continues. Police attempting to make an arrest this afternoon outside the White House in the middle of the pro-Palestine rally kicking off now. A crowd surrounded with them chanting, let her go, and struggled with officers who deployed mace against protesters and press. So mm. let's check it out. Yep, rolling the bean footage. So, well, I mean, the usual shenanigans uh, with uh, the Metro Police slash Secret Service. Yeah, um, you know them well. Before it continued, um, before it continued, um, the next tweet. What? Um, here you go. This right here. Yeah. To note, it's not clear to me what led up to the arrest itself. I'll try to find that out when I can. A handful of people helped by pouring water in my eyes afterwards. If you all are reading this, thank you. So you're we welcome. Got taken care of. Um, so let's get into some more, a little more lighthearted, a little more lighthearted. Um, we're gonna feature our favorite neighborhood web singer here, uh, who made an appearance at the rally. So, um, so let's see what our favorite superhero Spider-Man has to say. About Palestine. We 
vetoed you with genocide. Biden, Biden, we can't wait. Biden, Biden, we can't wait. Why do you uh, support Palestine, Mr. Spider-Man? Because I have a heart, I have a soul, and I love the people, I love the children. Long live Palestine, free Palestine, baby. Shoulder rotations, good for you, dog. Um, <laughs> I'll say he's very limber. Whoever that was, yeah, dude. Uh, Someone's been doing the so, calisthenics. Um, yeah, so we'll play a little bit more. Uh, just, just to be a little bit more lighthearted with this. Uh, so we'll show you some scenes that Ford recorded uh, while he was there. So we'll play this for about five to six minutes, Reef. Okay. On the next slide. Yep. Uh so yeah, we'll just um yeah, we'll just check out some footage from Saturday. Can't okay, hear. There's the red line. <laughs>
So we got mm -hmm. a little bit of footage. Like I said, for Fisher, he recorded a ton. So either follow him on Twitter at Ford Fisher, or yep. you can go to his YouTube cha channel at New Share, and you can watch more clips or more of the rally in full if you're mm. interested. So we always want to give shout outs to independent um, journalists and editors who do the work, and Ford did a lot of it. So a lot of work. We show him some love. Um, so, so you continue, uh, if not now org and just, uh, Jews for peace, uh, yeah. Jewish voice for peace, how the mourners cut ish for Rafa outside the white house tonight, Lily Greenberg call a Jewish Biden appointee who resigned two weeks ago to protest the bombardment of Israel. I think she's made the rounds in mainstream media, like within the last couple of weeks, spoke right. out. Uh, so actually, I'm not going to read all of that because she kind of mentions it in the clip. So let's see what she says at the rally. My name is Lily. Can everyone hear me OK? Mm -hmm. um, my name is Lily Grimberg Call. It, until two weeks ago, I was an appointee in the Biden administration. And two weeks ago, I resigned from the Biden administration because I could no longer serve at the pleasure of a president who is aiding and abetting the genocide of the Palestinian people with American tax dollars and under the guise of Jewish safety. A genocide that does not bring the hostages home, that does not keep Israelis safe, does not keep Jews safe, that has killed over 35,000 Palestinian of them, Palestinians, 15,000 of them children, and who knows how many more stuck under the rubble right now. Shame. 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 So my whole life, as a Jewish person, I learned stories of our people Shame. burning in crematoriums. The stories that live in our people's history that live in my bones of ashes falling over concentration camps ashes of human beings an endless winter the burning of europe's jews for the sake of hegemony and supremacy and then over the weekend i watch we all watch a video of palestinian people burning alive in their tents Children watching their parents burned alive. Shame. Shame. Parents picking up ashes of their children. Shame. And the bombs that doing this are dropped by planes with a Magen David on them, funded by the people in that building. Shame. Bought and paid for with our tax dollars. Shame. Um. So like I said, if you want to watch the whole thing of, of Lily's speech, you can go to Ford Fisher's. I think he has it on his Twitter page, so you can watch it in an entirety. Um, but yeah, that just gives, I think, a, it, it just a snippet. Like I said, if we if we went through the whole rally, we would back in the all could be, be here for a while. Yeah. Well, yeah, that could essentially been our whole episode tonight. Um, but we have other stories we need to do. So, uh, but yeah, but I don't think there's much to say, and mm. I'm not sure if you have anything you want to say. But it just felt, you know, uh, uh, just more the same. You know, like we've, I, I, you know, I reported at the DC um, rally back in what was it in November? We reported on the one that happened, I believe it was in March. So, I mean, one thing I could say is that it's good that these rallies are happening you know at least it's gathering people is kind of helping people to focus on the issue um you know but that aside and this kind of leads into my next point because as i said we're going to report on the good and the bad the highlights and the lowlights um so this is probably a low light now unfortunately uh this person 
made her account private before I was able to pull the whole thread. Um, I think she got a lot of hate for this tweet uh, yeah. because I think she closed, like she made her account private. Um, I think after some comments. So, but I was able to pull this one. Uh, this is the first of I think of a thread of about five tweets she did regarding the protest of the rally, and she so at Comrade Shakira uh, commented. I'm incredibly disappointed in today's red line action in D.C. We cannot generally be the red line for the administration enabling genocide while not doing any material action aside from speeches and a long red banner around the White House. And actually, funny enough, I had a friend shout out to James um, who uh, was kind of coming in. He was visiting from Baltimore. Um... And I actually met up with him Saturday night briefly. Uh, and he told me that he didn't think much of the rally other than it was just just a lot of speeches and just the people just hanging out and everybody was just and went home. Well, he actually left early, he told me, because he didn't find it not I wouldn't say inspiring, but he just didn't feel like it, it just felt very random. It just felt disorganized and really wasn't worth his time to be there. So he left early. Um, and we've talked about this before, you know, just in terms of the point behind rallies and and its effectiveness. And I think we've said this on the show, I've said this on the show many times. One of the things I do get frustrated with in terms of rallies is it's great to kind of gather people towards a cause, but the issue that I usually have is what happens after that? How are you going to gather these people in terms of organizing to really affect the system? You know, it's one thing to kind of talk about the issue, but the issue is not the, the issue in itself is not the issue. The issue is the system by which a lot of the wrongs in our, um, in our society and what we're seeing globally um, is what's the problem. And shout out to social emotional learning with Dr. Donnie, who commented, people tired of symbolic action. So that's yeah. what Dr. Uh, Comrade Shakira was implying from the tweets that I did read, that it just felt very symbolic and not anything substantive, which also kind of confirms with what my friend James said. It just yeah. felt like it was just more of the idea of being seen and performative versus actually really connecting and actually doing direct action. Yeah. Um, anything you want to say? Actually, no, you know what? I... Let's play the clip before I do any of this first. I will... Okay. Cool. Um, Which clip? So, oh, the Turi clip. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I find sending on to you on Discord. So I think... We have to bring this guy up again. Uh, mm -hmm. And I actually thought about this this morning um, as I was getting ready, um, you know, because I think he kind of fits in to a lot of the thoughts that I think Comrade Shakira made uh, that I was also thinking about uh, actually while I was showering in the morning. So we played him, we played this clip many times, but I think it bears repeating again for this. Mm -hmm. uh, we might as well play the whole thing since so it's kind of short. So let's hear what. But li really listen to what Kwame says in terms of organizing as, as opposed to mobilizing. Um, so go ahead. This is linked to mobilization and organization, something we mentioned last year. We must make clear distinctions between mobilizers and organizers. To be an organizer, you must be a mobilizer. But being a mobilizer doesn't make you an organizer. Much confusion is to be found here. Malcolm X was a great mobilizer. He was a great organizer. Martin Luther King was a great mobilizer. He was not a great organizer. These facts can be easily seen from King and Malcolm. When Malcolm went to a place, he left a mosque. When King went to demonstrations, he broke down desegregation and he moved on. As a matter of fact, King was 
not concerned with organization to the point that even though he was the most popular Baptist preacher in America without the shadow of a doubt and probably beyond the shadow of a doubt the most loved he could not become president of the Baptist National Baptist Association uh, Convention yeah so many of them the National Baptist Convention <laughs> as a matter of fact if my memory serves me correctly now and I remember it was Mohammed Speaks that uh, carried the article on the front page in 1964 when King tried to become president of the National uh, Baptist Convention there was so much confusion there that a minister was actually put, pushed off the stage and died in his trouble yeah. and of course King lost the man who won was a reactionary man by the name of Jackson he never did nothing for the people never cared about the people just was a pork chop minister who used their money to put gas in his big Cadillac but he was organized but he was organized we say that we must come to know the difference between mobilization and organization because the enemy will use mobilization to demobilize us mobilization is very easy very very easy because since we're people who are instinctively ready to respond against acts of injustice anytime there's one little act of injustice we can blow it up and we'll find people who come and make some mass demonstration around it Miss Sally lost her job let's rally she got her job back people will come and rally so and so got kicked out of school because the teachers unjust the unjust the people will come and rally they will come to rally at issues and this is what mobilization does it mobilizes people around issues those of us who are revolutionary are not concerned with issues we're concerned with the system the difference must be properly understood the difference must be properly understood mobilization usually leads for reform action not to revolutionary action mm. if we would look scientifically at the October 16th million and more March we would see clearly that this was a mobilized event not an organized event we must know clearly the difference between mobilization and organization one of the characteristics of mobilization is that it is temporary organization is permanent and eternal clear differences must be made because the unconscious can usually be captured easily around one issue items around mobilization items but it's hard to catch them around organization but these unconscious must be brought to organization we must transform mobilization to organization we say the enemy will come and use mobilization to demobilize us many brothers and sisters who've been to the million and more march will say to you I was there well what are you doing today my sister I was there there weren't too many sisters out there but you know with a million brothers together you know where I had to be I was there yes. <laughs> and then of course you find brothers yeah I was there I was there I helped you what are you doing today brother if we're not careful we allow mobilization to become events the struggle is never an event it's a process a continual eternal process I mean, you know why? <laughs> and I think we've talked about this off camera, but yeah, it's just a lot more of this versus organizing, which takes a lot of work. It's more behind the scenes. And depending on what it is, takes years to really come to mm -hmm. fruition. So and it's also but very it's easily co-opted and manipulated, as well as mobilization. So it's like right, which right. Kwame's I talked think about even the key with that, and right, which she, yes, and mm -hmm. Misty shout out to her because she's talked about this. I think especially with her son's actions, she mm -hmm. has mentioned that how very careful she is of who she kind of allows within her circle to do any of the rallies or any of the organizing that she does for that reason. So it's kind of like those kind of things in particular you want to protect because, and I think you saw even in the civil rights movement, get like Black Panthers, hello. You know, mm -hmm. there were people who infiltrated, you know, yep. what the Black Power movement was trying to do. So 
there's a lot of care and a lot of wariness that you have to do in order to organize. But it's a necessary thing if you want revolutionary change. Now, how does this relate to this rally? Mm -hmm. I would argue, and thank you for pulling this up. So this is actually um, a chart that uh, I looked at at my, one of my organizational meetings uh, three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so at the top, you can kind of see the type of organizing that is direct service, self-help, civic engagement, advocacy, organizing. And then you see the focus. So some of it is individual uh, and the others are systemic. Um, how those, organize, those organization types relate to, well, the change of, with, that you're looking for within that organization structure depends on the relationship to the existing power structure and then the role of the constituent slash you. Mm. And so if you take a look at the chart and if you look toward the bottom where you see um, advocacy, um, the focus of that change is systemic, uh, but the relationship to that power structure is for you, you exist, you access you accept the existing power structure, but you challenge the outcome. Became so reformist. as Tommy was saying that, so the idea of that is kind of more of a reformist stance. So the res your role with, within that as a response is a passive one. As the uh, example gives, attendance at rallies, etc. It doesn't require much of you to do. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and I see this as, and we were talking about this last night, we do not know for sure within that rally who was there really for revolutionary change. Yeah, some people might be there. I would argue many people were there, you know, because they want Palestine to be free and they want a ceasefire and all that kind of stuff. But Honestly, that the idea of having a ceasefire, you know, in terms of what's happening in Palestine is really the floor, honestly. Mm. Like, you get the ceasefire, then what's going to happen? Where's the revolutionary change? Right. And we've talked about this, too, is that often when we talk about organizing and when, when we think about policy, we often don't think about what's the end goal, what's the grand prize. So in, in the case of Palestine, what is the grand prize? It's not a ceasefire. No. Like, no, that's step one. Yeah. The real grand prize is the liberation of the country. Yeah. So what is that going to take? So after the ceasefire, what that will that entail? Like, there. so along with that, given that, so the last um, type of organizing is the organizing. Um. So which challenges the existing power structure and which is, as a result of that, your role is a more active one, which is the development and implementation of campaign planning and actions. So uh -huh. there's strategy involved. There's You're gonna have a time plan involved. You have to plan this out. So that's not to say that rallies in and of themselves are bad. They're not. But what I see as of late, and I think in more recent history, what I'm seeing is often, I think the idea is you do the rally first and then organize from there, which I argue is extremely difficult to do. It should be in reverse. There should be organizing that has been occurring all along. And from that, from those actions, can result in a rally. That's, again, a good example of that is uh, Misty. Like, yeah. often when she has her rallies, that's usually in response to something that she's noticing within the trial, and she's connecting with her network and being like, okay, we've been doing this and this and this. We've been rallying at he here and here and here. Where should we go next? What should we plan next? These are the kind of discussions that I know we know that Misty has constantly. Yeah. So her rallies, they may be small in scoop, but they're not random. No. They're effective in terms of 
noticing what's happening with the Assange trial, noticing what they have done mm -hmm. in past rallies and what other actions they've done in the past, but also like mostly the lot of stuff that she does is ongoing. There's stuff that she does all the time that is not necessarily promoted probably as much as she does as she does, but she does what? Like candlelight vigils for Assange, like what, at least once frequently a week? Frequently tries to like yeah, frequently enough. So it's like these are the things that you may not necessarily know. And I'm giving Missy as an example, but the idea like with organizing, this is like a, almost, I would say, a lifelong thing. This is like yeah. a constant tending to in terms of planning and strategizing and implementing action plans to meet your goal. It's not just a one-off like a rally can be. Yeah. And so I think we're kind of hitting that point and we talked about it last week or a couple of weeks ago with Caitlin Johnstone. I think she meant this in a good way in terms of like the Palestine is becoming popular to kind of talk about. I think there's also, there's a double-edged sword in that because yes, it's becoming popular, but people are looking at it in the way that you know, during like the Black Lives Matter movement, especially with George Floyd, that people would put, I think we're putting like that black square like on their Instagram profiles or some bullshit like that. It's yep. just very performative and it's just the idea of like, and I would argue even, you know, I have a watermelon in my profile name on Twitter, but the difference is <laughs> I've talked about the significance right. of it. You know, mm -hmm. I've done the research in order for that. We talked about that on the show, you know, many times in relation to that, the watermelon and its significance in Palestinian and black culture. So, but I think most people will just put up the watermelon emoji because they know, oh, it's Palestine and not necessarily know or educate themselves on the significance of it and why it's important. Yeah. So, but I think in this last... Uh, table that I have here. Uh, organizing is relationship building is a point and central and the entry point into. You can't do that at a rally necessarily. No. Like you, if anything, that should be happening before you have the rally. Um, and I think that's ultimately the most important thing is building relationships with people. Um, organizing is a collective effort that relies on numbers to create change. Organizing is an outside strategy. Civic engagement is inside. Organizing has a longer term focus. Again, it's the idea of like, what's the end goal? What's the grand prize of what you want? Like a lot of that stuff, especially when you're dealing with policy is gonna take time and years to develop and really put into fruition. Organizing is about demanding power, not accommodation or access. Um, organizing develops leadership skills. Like, you're going to need, and we talked about this, I think, in terms of, you know, parties. Like, who are the leaders? Who will rise up to the occasion and being recognized as leaders within the community and such and elevate and highlight those actions by those people for them to help pr make these uh, promotions? So, yeah. I don't necessarily see people doing that, Definitely not but, leaders with you know, clear, just, concise you know, plans, goals, and wants for actual right. power outside right. of this system. So, right. Like, you know, so, like, it's either, what, what was it? Um, accommodation or access. Like, we don't need access anymore. Right. And we don't need to be accommodated, no. which is what these feel like, you know? Right. He says, you need to be taking your power back, as Rage Against the Machine would tell you, you know? Right. So, how that looks, I'm not sure yet. But, no, and it, like look, art, no you'll know expert. it when you see it, I'm betting. Right. I'm no expert on this. I'm just learning this. But, mm -hmm. right. But the idea is, is that you're building in relationships with people you're cultivating that kind of community and you're kind of developing your thesis of the issue together yeah. and be aligned on that thesis to figure out, okay, this is what we want to do. This is, 
you know, this is the end goal. What's the plan? Let's strategize as to how we can get this step by step by step by step. So right. unfortunately, that's not the sexy work, you know, and this is why, you know, like you for many times with organizers, you may not know who they are because mm -hmm. they're often working behind the scenes. They often do not want to be seen. You know, yeah. they're often in the background wanting to elevate other people in order for them to kind of make the message, especially if they're more charismatic, to make the message more apparent to a larger group of people slash, right. you, know, the, you know, your audience. Yeah. So, you know, so again, I'm not knocking any rallies. I think they have a place, but I also believe that rallies have a place in terms of actual organizing. I believe that has to come first, and then the rallies are birthed from there. But I think that people are just looking to have the rally. But then the idea, and even as Kwame has said, you know, you be hyped up for a day, and then you just sit down. Like, you can't, you know, you can't build that energy off of, like, one-offs. Right. You know, you need to build something you know, consistent. So that, so hopefully, you know, like I just wanted to kind of show that in terms of, um, it, you know, it's hard because I get why people want to do it. I think people are kind of desperate, you know, for doing something and, you know, it does make a difference, you know, especially if mainstream media is able to report on, on these issues and kind of give a highlight to them. But we also have to think about this in terms of a long haul fight, like the idea of a liberation for Palestine or any country for that matter is going is going to take a long time, you know. So I think the re the reality is, are people willing to make that investment for the long haul? Um, and how can we build that community or with people that are willing to walk alongside you? Um, so that you're able to hopefully in your lifetime be able to see that change that you want to see happen and then have that change happen to the full. Like not compromising on as half measures or like sidestepping in order for politicians to get the kind of win that they need versus, um, you know, what you're demanding from them and them actually giving it to you. Right. Well, Anything more you want to add before? No, I think it's, uh, you know, like conflicted a little bit because I do feel like this is useful. You know, it's just to what end? I, you know, I'm the first one to talk about the difference between organizing and just outreach, you know. So yeah. I, I just don't know how they get power back at this point, you know? Right. Um, like, because the more you try to take power, the more they will enact fascism. To keep so it's kind of a double-edged right. sword on that. Like, yes, you have right. to we win the means of democracy, but I don't know if they're going to let you do that yet. So No, but I think, no, they're not going to let you do that yet, but that's why it has to come from the outside. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's apparent is that, and we made this point is that we you can't expect the powers that be to just give you the power. They're not going to. And even if you it, even if they let you in, it's basically you have to play ball by their rules. Yeah. So you have to kind of succumb to the pressure of, you know, following them, and then you're being corrupted yourself. So the idea is that if you're outside the game, you're able to better but mostly protect what you're trying to cultivate in terms of revolutionary change. Yeah. Uh, but again, that takes time. That takes a lot of courage. But more importantly, you have people, you need to have people who are invested, truly invested in the mission and being unapologetic in that so that the hope is that it doesn't get corrupted even when in the face of people who will try to uh, occupy it or co-opt it for their means. So, yeah, but I think we definitely need to, especially in independent media, it's just very easy just to kind of fall behind a person who says the right policy or 
talks in a way that it's like, oh, they're talking about this, so it's not that other person, but rather, you know, what are the systems in place on the ground that are able to kind of help cultivate some of these revolutionary actions that we want to see on a smaller scale? Like, yeah. you need to have some wins. And the problem with the left is we haven't had any wins. Like, we've been so down out and defeated that right now we're trying, we're basically arguing now, like, how to move forward, which we really should not be, you know? Yeah. But it's the idea of, like, okay, what do we need to do to kind of get a little win on a smaller scale and build that out to other places so that people can be inspired and that can cause some movement building in terms of actually bringing something to a rally and kind of saying, this is what we did. This is what we're able to accomplish. How can we maximize that win on a larger scale that will kind of threaten the establishment? So yeah. those are the conversations that I hope within the space that we have. Hopefully, you know, after this election, Ugh. people might be a little bit more serious, but agreed. Who knows? Um, yeah. But anyway, um, so thank you guys for letting me go off on that sermon for a bit. Um, but if you want to help us out uh, in terms of financial donations, like we say, you know, always take care of your families, your neighborhoods, your communities first. But if you want care to give us a little something, something, you know, we do this out of love, but we obviously need to continue to any support, you know, to help, you know, pay the bills around here in addition to upcoming stuff that we want to do in order to build out the network. Uh, you can go to kofi.com slash indie news network, or you can scan the QR code on your screen uh, and make a donation uh, via Kofi that way. Um, you can also, you know, go to our Patreon and all our other links, uh, which will be in the description of any way else you can support financially. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to us. Uh, be sure to make a comment. We do read them all. Um, and help us get to 2K. I think we're, I think the last time I checked, thanks to, I think, in like being our hard lives, we actually got, think? I think, no, I think actually maybe less than that. I think 14 right now. Mm. So um, we're 14 oh. subs away from 2K. So, um, so yeah, I would try, We let's see if we can get free tonight so we can be at 1990. Yeah. Um, the year I was 10 years old. <laughs> uh, you weren't even born yet. No. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Uh, you weren't even fought yet. So. I'm going to get to 93, bro. You know? All right. Um, uh. And yeah, thank you guys for your support and thanks for watching.